Ja. Ja, Karl? Hi. Hi, everybody. So, for the uh, last talk, I am uh, and I'll be talking about the topic of my PhD, which is um, trying to extend a sequence alignment by being aware of motifs. And I'll tell you in a moment what that means. Uh, it's a bit unfortunately that you won't have the sequence analysis course for you, uh, for those of you who will be doing the bioinformatics track. The sequence analysis course doesn't start until the next period. So some of these concepts may not be understandable yet. But bear with me. Um, so the first thing, what is a motif? Uh, a motif is defined as in a biological sequence, you have a little bit of subsequence that has a functional role. Uh, for example, in uh, DNA, this might be the place, a specific pattern of nucleotides to which a transcription factor will bind. Uh, in proteins, this might be, for example, uh, a lot of proteins you have bind zinc for catalytic activity, and you might have what's called a zinc finger motif. So these are different amino acids that are uh, placed in a certain way so that the zinc ion can bind to, to them. Uh, and what you can see here is the pattern that encodes this motif. This is a very simple one, and this is a very... You don't need to know how, what these patterns mean, you can kind of guess. Um, uh, so an, an important thing to know is that motifs which are active are conserved. Just because a motif is there in the sequence doesn't actually mean that it has any role. Uh, mo like, like I said, I showed you the DNA one. That one is very simple. It's not that difficult to have one of these motifs appearing by chance. So, um, so you can see here, if you do a sequence alignment, you can see here, well, this G is probably important and part of the motif. Uh, so, Usually what you would do to see whether a motif is active or whether it's just there by chance, you use a line of sequences and then you generate this kind of plot and you see, well, okay, these, these motifs are conserved and these are not, so these are probably active and these are not. Um, there is a problem there though. Uh, a classic multiple sequence alignment algorithm um, is weighs every position in the alignment the same. So it doesn't really care whether a position has been annotated as matching a motif pattern or whether it's just a, another symbol in the sequence. And the problem is this is that we would really like this to be upweighted in terms of importance for the alignment. Uh, this is a standard, very popular sequence alignment method. As you can see, it kind of makes a mess of it. Um, so we went about to try to solve this problem, and what we came up with, and I've already described the problem, which is that the uh, thing of line weighs all positions equally, so we devised a very simple solution. What if we just apply a weighting factor to the positions that we already know are important? Uh, you can see that kind of here, and again, the algorithm will come next period, so that's a bit unfortunate. Um, but you can see a uh, few sequences here. Um, the first, these two, these two symbols are part of the motif. You have a second sequence in which these two symbols are part of the motif. Um, as you can see, if you don't apply the motif boost, it will just align it. And we would expect these two symbols to be on the line top of each other, and that doesn't happen. Uh, so if we then turn on the motif boost, which is denoted by alpha here, and we say alpha is 10, the higher you, you, you make alpha, the stronger the motif boost is going to be. Uh, so this is kind of a soft constraint that we place on the system. It's not like that, 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 we, that motifs have to be aligned on top of each other, but they do have to, the higher we put alpha, the stronger the, the, the uh, a boost towards aligning motifs on top of each other becomes. Um, we have 
first applied this principle on DNA alignments. Uh, so this was uh, something that was published in 2015, uh, where we tried to measure um, the conservation of enhancer sites on the DNA. Uh, this, was, uh, uh, this was called combines. Uh, what you can see in here is the normal alignment with a normal sequence alignment program. Uh, you can see it doesn't do that badly for some motifs, but it does do very poorly for the red motif, for example. Uh, then you have our method, and you can see it does much better. It doesn't give a perfect result, but it doesn't, the red motifs which were completely scattered before are now nicely aligned. And to reiterate, this has implications for the conservation of a motif, uh, and the conservation has implications for the functionality of the motif. Uh, we experimentally uh, verified the activity of these motifs. Uh, so higher is more activity in a, in, a, in a real mouse model. And you can see that things which are not very well conserved don't show a lot of activity. Uh, activity like you can see here, well, this is just scattered. Whereas if you have all the conservation, for example, the, the red motifs here, they do show activity. And important to notice that you would have completely missed the red motif had to use the standard alignment. Now, um, for the most part of my PhD, I have been working on this concept and trying to generalize it to biological sequences of any kind, not just DNA. Because combine was more of a proof of concept where we tried, well, does this actually work? And we only tried on a very specific use case, namely DNA. Um, so I uh, I've developed a tool called Modus Verbally. Uh, it's a, uh, you might have heard of Kalin, it's the sequence alignment program that we developed here uh, at the university, and I extended it to be aware of motifs. Uh, and I, one of the things I applied this to is to try to solve a problem. Uh, generally, when a researcher wants to do some kind of sequence analysis, they first, of course, have to make an, an alignment. But it's often the case that the researcher already knows how the alignment should look like. They already know, well, I. These, these residues are part of the same catalytic, uh, catalytic domain, so they should probably be aligned on top of each other. So, and we allow the researcher to specify this beforehand, rather than having to take an alignment editor and having to align everything uh, himself. Uh, so this saves a lot of time. Um, the other uh, use case we tried is to and this is more similar to the DNA combined use case, is to have a look at motor conservation. The specific use case we had was the uh, HIV uh, GP120 protein. Uh, and this is a protein that is part of the viral capsid. And it is used, I think it is used by HIV to enter the cell. Um, what the HIV virus does is to glycosylate parts of, of, of this protein. Uh, because if, an, uh, uh, um, if the protein is exposed to the immune system, it may happen uh, that antibiotic bodies will be generated against it. And to prevent this from happening, the HIV uh, uh, virus constantly modifies the place in which the, 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 the protein is glycosylized so that there can't be a single antibody generated against it. And this is a way in which the uh, uh, HIV uh, virus evades the immune response. Um, this is done with a regular alignment program. Um, you can see it's not very good. And these are the, 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 the glycosylation motifs here. And you can see if we put this into motif work volume, it's actually nicely stacked. Uh, and by measuring, well, by measuring the alignment here, you can basically say, well, if I have look at this protein in position uh, uh, 100 to 104, there's always a glycosylation motif here. So this is probably an important place for the, for the virus. Because if, there weren't a, uh, if it weren't conserved, then the virus doesn't care to have it to evade the, the, the immune, immune response. Um, I've probably gone a bit quicker than that I would have liked, but uh, the take-home take message is uh, 
Motif aware alignment improves the alignment quality on the motif bridge regions. I've showed you this. Uh, and there's basically two main use cases to measure conservation, either on DNA or in proteins, and uh, um, to, for a secondary, uh, a secondary function is to, for a researcher trying to make a large scale alignment to prevent them from having to hand edit an eventual alignment result to get it to look nice and to incorporate their own previous knowledge into that alignment. Um, I would just like to reiterate that demand exists for these tools. Um, the Combine was first published in 2015, but it still to this day generates collaboration requests from other universities who have looked at the web server and say, well, we've got this custom DNA use case, can't you run the uh, Combine on, for it, um, on it for us? And I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, M. Aquiline was accepted for publication uh, last week, so I'm very glad of that. Um, and will be published in post computational biology probably somewhere in the coming months. Um, a little bit about what we're going to do, where we're going to go next. Uh, in proteins, what we want to do is to see whether we can apply the principles that, they, that we've developed for uh, uh, MAPCALI on other types of, of annotations. So we're using motifs now, uh, but we're thinking about maybe using um, whether an amino acid is on the surface or in the form of a protein, or whether uh, a, an amino acid is predicted to have a certain type of secondary structure, or basically any type of amino acids or nucleotide level annotation that you can do. And then we just say, well, pro proteins or, or amino acids that have been annotated as being a helix are more likely to be annotated on top of each other than proteins who have not been annotated as the same secondary structure type. And we can see where this improves our the alignment as well. Um, on DNA, we basically want to have more use cases. So. Uh, we have developed a method, it works very well, but we are not experimental biologists, so we would really like to have the experimental biologist tell, well, this is what we want to use this for. So we have a few collaborations going on. Uh, one of them is uh, trying to find differences in enhancer size between uh, mammals and non-mammals. So this is implicated in the, uh, research against breast cancer. Uh, the other thing is that we're, uh, Try to find differences in enhancer sites, uh, in, in enhancer site conservations between animals who are able to recover from spinal cord injury and animals who aren't uh, able to recover from spinal cord injury, to try to find a dif differential motifs that are present in the animals that are not able to to, to recover or otherwise, um, and obviously, uh, if a motif is conserved. Um, or then have, losing that motif is more likely to be bad. Uh, you can see it here, you, for example, if this motif is gone, then this, of course, results in something not being able to bind to, to the DNA anymore, which can cause all kinds of diseases. Uh, right, so I would just like to thank my group members. Uh, of course, Sonny, Sonny Yap and Anton, you probably know. Uh, Punto is a former PC student in the group. Uh, and my other uh, few colleagues, uh, Bob Hawking. Ah, so I'm done. Are there any questions? Yes? Um, <laughs> Simple type being substituted for another. Uh, the alignment is always multiple alignment isn't, the pairwise alignment is always multiple. So, according to the, to, to, to the probability model that you put in, it's always going to be the best possible alignment. Uh, so, what we kind of do is recognizing that the probability model is probably wrong. So, if you put in a more accurate probability model, then you get a, a 
you get something that <laughs> might, might have a lower score, right. uh, but it does have more biological significance because it's closer to, to what. That was my question. Yeah. Uh, how small can the how small can the motives be to be uh, identified? Um, a, a friend of mine has actually uh, used combine in a project of uh, this uh, to find evolutionary reserved transcription factor binding sites, but he had a problem that they were actually so small that uh, the aligner wouldn't correctly align them. Um, I actually have a, I put in a few extra slides to help with questions. So this is. An analysis I did for the article, uh, and basically I measured uh, I measured the differences in behavior between very short, medium length, and very large patterns. Uh, this is the motif boost or the conservation signal. Uh, so the higher this is, the more conserved these these patterns are. You can see that the short patterns do have a much different behavior from the rest of the sequence. You can basically see that for the other two classes of patterns, it's mostly on this line, which is the maximum conservation line. So it's coming out, for, forget about these two, that's an artifact. But generally, you can see no, nothing can transcend this threshold, uh, whereas these show different behavior. Uh, it is problem more problematic, um, but it's not, um, well, of course, there's always a, a threshold at which you have more more noise than signal you've got the garbage in garbage out principle so uh, but it wasn't unworkable uh, uh, in the majority of cases for us uh, the other thing is we benchmarked it as well and we had well, we had a look at how the different scores so this is what's done on, on, on the benchmark set this is the overall alignment quality this is the motif alignment quality so the higher this gets the better the, the, the more motifs are aligned on top of each other and the higher this gets, the overall line to play. Uh, uh, uh. You can see that if you start increasing alpha, then the alignment quality goes down dramatically. And this is also due to uh, uh, that you have small spurious motifs and eventually if you make this, uh, if you make alpha strong enough, it will just pull the entire alignment apart just to align these things on top. So uh, that's it.
make sure somebody else puts an answer there. It doesn't have to be the correct answer. It should be a somewhat sensible answer. Yeah. And then we can take it from there. This helps you. So thinking of questions and also answering other people's questions is a tremendous way of preparing for the exam. Off the top of my head, next week, Tuesday at 10. Um, shall, shall I check that to be, to be sure? Olga agrees with me that it's Tuesday at 10. <laughs>